I'll give it another minute or so because people are... Before you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I haven't started yet because there are people still. Yeah, people, yeah. It's only 60 now. It's only 60. It's terrible. I, I just spoke to the, the secretary. Uh -huh. She has no idea, no clue what's yeah. going on. And uh, there are about 115 registered participants. Yeah. Registered means that they're physically present somehow. Maybe so we should uh, have a list going around to see who's yeah, yeah, actually yeah. there. Yeah, I think I think I will, I will, this is really uh, something. Yeah. Let, let me put to my hint also because okay, most of these guys come from these countries. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's annoying. Yeah. Mm It's better if I we have, we have ten minutes to start five minutes later. Yeah. Okay, because yeah, yeah. we have the entire day. Uh, so you have an announcement still, no? Do you have an announcement? Come yeah, I have an announcement. Good morning, everybody. I uh, have a couple of announcements before we start with the daily lectures. First of all, uh, there is going to be the, we are going to shoot a couple of group pictures in front of the main entrance. So it's just on the left here where all the flags are, okay? Not this entrance on the left, the, the huge one, the, the bigger one, okay? So that's at half, half past two in the afternoon. So it would be good if all of us are, are there. Second, uh, we are going to circulate a list of the presences because there is a certain mismatch between the registered participants who are physically present and those who are actually attending the lectures. So we just want, uh, want to make sure that people who are actually following the lectures get the reward. 
So we will now let, there's a simple sheet, you just write in block letters your, your name and, and your signature, okay? And uh, while we circulate it, we can start with uh, lecture three by Professor Plenia. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, three and four actually. Three and four, right. <laughs> okay, right, so welcome everybody. It's even earlier than yesterday, um, but well, okay. Um, so, so yesterday I, I told you about, um, um, about uh, classical information and classical correlation, and I tried to explain to you the concept that these are resources for, to achieve certain tasks when you are suffering from some constraints by using this idea of trying to make secret, transmitting secret information using uh, public communication only. And I showed you that secret correlations were such a resource that allows you to achieve that. And um, that really formed kind of the, the, the structure that, that we also will be following now in quantum information, or we have started to follow because I started to speak about quantum information, which was uh, defined as high, how much can you reduce the required size of a Hilbert space to represent the, the quantum state of, a, of an information source. And uh, the ratio, the compression ratio, gave you the amount of information per, um, uh, per, per sent physical particle. And um, then I started to speak about quantum correlations, but I, I started a little bit differently. I basically uh, set a task this time. Um, namely, I had to transmit an unknown quantum state. And um, I did, uh, did so under a constraint, namely that I can only ever uh, conduct experiments locally in my laboratory, so let's say my laboratory here and the laboratory of Fabrizio over there. And I was only able to communicate classically between us. <clears throat> and uh, so I could not just send the, the quantum particle with its information from one place to the other. And that, that posed a certain challenge, so, and, and the um, or constraint. And the resource that allowed me to overcome this was a particular um, quantum state that I wrote down. It was of the form, well, I can already write it uh, again. It was the quantum state of this uh, form that was shared. Uh, oh, oh. Um, OK, that's interesting. Uh, so I um, shouldn't come too close to the board. So that was this kind of uh, quantum state here. And this is actually an entangled quantum state. That means it's, it has quantum correlations. And that might not be very surprising to you, because you see it clearly has correlations. When I make a measurement on the, uh, on the side of LS, so party A, I get uh, in the basis 0 or 1. Then I get either the state 0 or the state 1. And Whatever state Alice finds, Bob will find the same. So they're clearly, in the measurement record, they're clearly correlations. And because they're local measurements, the only point, the only place where these correlations can be, come from, uh, can be coming from um, is, is the underlying quantum state. So there are some correlations. And um, now these correlations allow us to do something that we cannot do by classical communication alone, namely we can transfer a quantum state from one place to the other. So these are really stronger correlations than merely classical correlations. So they are quantum correlations. Right. Um, I think that's pretty much what we had. Um, then I showed you the protocol. I explained to you this quantum state teleportation uh, protocol where I used this, this state as a resource. I put in here um, an unknown quantum state on Alice's side, and then I did a bit of rewriting, and then I performed a measurement, a projective measurement on Alice's side, and then there was some classic communication being exchanged, and as a result, end result of that, Bob, the other party, held exactly the quantum state that uh, was provided initially to um, Alice here. 
so we achieved the task. So now what I want to do is, um, so I used some, some ingredients, namely classic communication, and in fact, I also showed you that afterwards, the, this entangled state that was shared between Alice and Bob was gone, and actually we only had some two particles that were entangled on Alice's side locally, but there were no correlations left between Alice and Bob. Okay, so these were the outcomes, so this was uh, an executive summary of, um, uh, of uh, yesterday's lecture. But now I want to ask um, some simple question, um, and that could also, you could also be wondering about, I have actually two questions here. One is, could I have achieved the same with less correlations, whatever that precisely means? Um, and could I have achieved the same with less classical communication? Was it really necessary that I communicate here the outcome of uh, Alice's measurement from from Alice to Bob, uh, which cost me two bits of information, two classical bits. Do I really need this? Can it maybe be that I need only one bit of information? Or maybe nothing. D does Alice really have to communicate with, with Bob? Yeah, so that's, that's not immediately clear. Yeah. Um, it could be that if I would have been cleverer, uh, I could have written down a different protocol that maybe require simpler measurements that have fewer outcomes and achieve, in the end, the same output. Yeah. And uh, so this is something that we want to explore briefly <coughs> because it is actually a principle that is very, that the principles that will come out of that are rather useful. So it's often in quantum information protocols when you have an element of communication in them and you have local operations and classical communication, you can often find out um, what are the minimal resources that you need by invoking principles such as by local operations and classical communication. You cannot create an entangled state. You can only create classical correlations, but no quantum correlations. And the other thing is that there is no superluminal communication in the world. Okay. And these two principles actually tell us something about the resources that we need to achieve this transfer of an unknown quantum state from Alice to Bob using other quantum resources. So let's briefly illuminate this. And as usual, I will um, not go through very formal proofs. I just give you a simple example that gives you the idea. And then I give you a reference where you can read a little bit more about this, where then, you know, the more the, the, the fully fledged proofs are there uh, so that you can understand this uh, more deeply. Um, okay. <coughs> mm, right. Okay. What? So, first question What is the minimal amount of uh, classical communication that is required for a successful quantum state teleportation protocol. And by that I mean not only the specific protocol that I have explained yesterday, by that I mean any protocol that involves local operations and classical communication that achieves the transfer of an unknown quantum state, completely randomly chosen, from Alice to Bob. Yeah? So I want to make a statement about any possible protocol, of which there are, of course, infinitely many. Okay? So let's see what we can uh, do here. And um, <coughs> so, okay, so how does this go? Um, Right. Um, okay. 
for that. I have to tell you something briefly first. Um, that was discovered a little bit earlier than the quantum uh, teleportation protocol, and namely a concept that is called uh, super dense coding. Yeah. So that was discovered um, in uh, uh, 1992, I believe. And um, as I'm making this up now, I didn't wrote down, I write down the um, the reference, but um, it was uh, Wiesner, no, I think, uh, so Bennett and Wiesner, and uh, this was in uh, Physical Review Letters in, I think it was in 1992, but there's really almost, I think there's only one or two papers from these two guys and uh, so you will find it quite, quite easily. Yeah. Um, and um, they asked themselves a slightly related question about communication. They asked, if I send one quantum particle that is a two-level system, so has just like a spin one-half particle, how much classical information can I possibly transmit using those particles? Or this particle, yeah. And actually, normally you would say, well, okay, what can I do? I take this particle, I prepare it in the ground state or the excited state, so 50-50 probability. I send this particle, um, obviously I transmit one bit of information and that should surely be the limit. Um, well, the answer is that's wrong. Actually, you can do more. And so how does this go? It's actually uh, very easy, it uses entanglement again. <coughs> so. We have here again, so Alice, and uh, we have, we have uh, Bob. And now let's assume that by some miracle, or some, someone provided them with this, um, they share initially two particles, one on Alice's side and one on Bob's side, and they are again correlated. In fact, I allow myself for them to share again Part, uh, two particles in this form. So this in itself carries no information because I say I always provide the same state, it's identically the same state, so if I would have a machine that does this repeatedly, then the ensemble would be described by a pure state, and so overall there would be no entropy, so no information. So no information has been uh, uh, provided here. So now, in the next step, Alice does one of four operations. Um, either, so Alice would like to two, send two bits. So either she wants to send the message 00, zero or she wants to send the message 01, or 10, or 11. One, one. Yeah? So whatever, some, 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 something that Bob wants to know, some, something with four possible outcomes. And um, so what does she do? So they have this state, and now, when Alice wants to send zero, zero, she does nothing. So that means she applies the identity operator to her particle. That means nothing, doing nothing. If she wants to send this, she actually applies the sigma x operator, the Pauli sigma x operator, that it flips zero and one. Um, that means, actually, uh, if, if, I, if she applies this to her particle, she ends up, or the two of them, end up in this state. Okay, and the nice thing is, this one is orthogonal on that one. Yeah. Okay, next step. <coughs> so, Alice wants to send, let's say, this message. She applies sigma z on her particle. And then she gets the state 0, 0, minus 0, a, um, 1a, 1b. Yeah, that's also a nice local operation. Bob didn't have to do anything, but this state is orthogonal on this one, and this state is orthogonal on that one. And then the last thing, uh, if she wants to send this message, well, 
she um, first applies sigma z and then she applies sigma x. And that means that she will end up with a, or the two of them will end up with this state. And again, this one is orthogonal on that one, this one is orthogonal on that one because of the minus sign, this one is orthogonal on that one. So now um, Alice has basically encoded her message in four orthogonal states. That does not help Bob at all because actually to find out, to really discriminate all these four states, he needs to have access to both particles. So, therefore, what Alice does in this protocol is now she sends the particle, so this particle here, will be sent to Bob. So that, so she sends one physical particle, only the one that she's holding. It, now Bob holds both of them. And locally, he's allowed to do whatever he likes, so he makes a projective measurement where the uh, observable that he's measuring has these four states as distinct eigenstates. So he makes a measurement. He can discriminate perfectly these four states. So he can read the information. Therefore, he can, yes, he can discriminate four states. He can identify which one it is. And so he can actually read out which of the four messages Alice has encoded. So he has received four possible outcomes. That means two bits of information. Only one particle was sent. So this is called superdense coding because, uh, well, I mean, this is uh, a bit hard. So by using these quantum correlations here, we actually, this allows us for a single particle to achieve a twice as high communication capacity than a classical system would have, a classical system that is not correlated with anything else. Okay, so that's, that's rather neat. That's, I mean, it's not a very practical use of entanglement, but I mean, it's unlikely that this will really be made use of very much in technology, but it is a very interesting example that you can actually here use correlations to enhance your information capacity. Yeah? So, um, so that's super dense coding. And now, let's see um, what this how I can combine now this super dense coding with teleportation. Basically, I want to show you that if I, can, I have the ability to implement a teleportation protocol, I can use it to um, transmit two classical bits of information from Alice to Bob. Yeah? And you, you already see there's almost nothing that I have to say because the essential step here was the transfer of a quantum state from Alice to Bob. That's exactly what teleportation does for you. So how does it look all together? So teleportation um, and superdense coding. Uh, coding. So we have now two entangled pairs. So one is, uh, I draw it really like, um, so this is often when you draw diagrams about entanglement, you make a wavy line between two two-level systems. That represents particle zero, zero, plus one, one. So that's our teleportation resource in the end. So this is used for teleportation. And then we have another pair of particles. That's here our super dense coding um, resource. Also prepared in the state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Yeah. So used for uh, Super dense coding, SDC. So, right? So, really? And now, the first step of our communication protocol is that Alice applies on this particle one of the four operations that she uses for encoding, so identity, sigma x, sigma z, or the product of the two. 
And then we use the teleportation protocol on these two particles. Yeah? So this is the particle to be teleported using these disentangled resource. So what is the outcome of the thing afterwards? Well, so now also exercise, yeah? Go through what I explain you in words now with formulas because that makes you much more comfortable with it that it's actually really true. Yeah? Um, so in the teleportation protocol, we make a projective measurement onto one of uh, these four possible states. So in the end, what we will end up with is some entanglement, well, some, some entangled particles that are sitting on Alice's side and another set that is sitting on Bob's side. So this is on Alice's side again. This is on Bob's side. So it's not only the state that has been transferred in the, um, in the teleportation protocol. If you would look at the state of this, uh, of the uh, if you would look at the reduced density matrix of this pair, and you would look at it, you would see that it's the identity matrix. So it's not only that the particle here in the end is in the identity matrix. All the correlations that this particle had with the rest of the world are also transferred. So this was initially entangled with that one. After the protocol, this state has been transferred to here and all its correlations as well. So in the end, you have this correlated particle here. And this is something you may just believe because I tell you, but you have to compute that yourself. Yeah? So that, because that's not completely evident. I mean, because we are carrying out some measurements and you know, it's, it's not such a, a I mean, calculation-wise, it's relatively trivial, but conceptually, this is not obvious at all that this uh, should happen. But that means now, of course, that um, Alice has prepared these two particles in one of the four L states here, in one of these four states. Now they are available here. And now Bob can locally make a measurement on those, identify which one it is, and therefore he achieves two bits of information. Okay. Fine. Um, so teleportation protocol can be used to transmit two bits of information from Alice to Bob. Um, why does this imply that we also have to use two bits of information from, why do we have to send two bits of information from Alice to Bob during the teleportation protocol? Yeah, so there's some, still something missing here in the argument. So this is just a, a property that I showed you. And now I want to invoke the, the principle that there's no superluminal communication. Now in general, this is not, uh, the argument is a little bit uh, more involved. I want to show, uh, consider a special case. Let's assume there was a teleportation protocol, an amended protocol, cleverer than mine, um, that actually um, does not require to, uh, Alice to send any information, any classical information to Bob. So, assume uh, there is a teleportation, uh, well, quant oh, quantum state teleportation protocol. Um, that does not require Alice to send any information, classical information, to Bob. Right, um, what does that actually imply? If Bob does not need to receive any information, he knows right away, after Alice has carried out her measurement, what sort of operations he may have to do to correct the quantum state on his side. And he can do this without actually waiting for Alice to tell, her, tell him her measurement outcome. 
so he can do this instantaneously. Yeah? There is no uncertainty for him. He doesn't need any piece of information to decide what to do. All right, so this, um, this means yeah, Bob does not need to wait for um, Alice to tell him about her um, operations. Yeah, so measurements, unitaries, whatever she did. Right, fine. And that's still, I mean, who knows, maybe that's possible. Uh, but now we combine this with this here, because we also know that we can use the teleportation protocol to transmit two bits of information from Alice to Bob. So now let's assume this exists. And so Alice will set up initially this. We have to have two, two entangled particles. Alice will encode her information here. Then she does something else. And she does this all in one moment, very quickly. And um, let's say Bob is you know, a light year away, so really far away. Um, immediately after Alice did all her operations here, because he doesn't need to hear any classical communication from her, and the protocol is assumed to work, he will have this situation, and he can immediately make a projective measurement here and identify which state he has, and he obtains arbitrarily quickly the two bits of information that Alice has encoded in this state. And that is faster than light communication. And that cannot be possible. I mean, at least if we believe that the relativity is correct. Yeah? So therefore, it's surely not possible to make a quantum state teleportation protocol without classical communication from Alice to Bob. OK. So that's the simplest case that I can think of to show you that there is clearly a problem. Now the natural question from you is, of course, well, OK, but how about Alice can, has to send one bit of information? Then this simple argument here doesn't work so well anymore. Now, now one has to use information theory and error correction methods and so on. So one can actually show that any protocol where I need to send less than two bits of information can be transformed into one that is of this type, where you need to send arbitrarily little, or actually vanishing information, from Alice to Bob. Now, that's more complicated, because you need to basically use redundant, uh, so you need to use error correction. And the basic idea behind the protocols, uh, behind the proof, then, is that, well, if Bob, for example, only needs to receive one bit of information, well, then he can start to actually make a guess so let's say it's really one bit that is required. He can make a 50-50 choice. And in 50% of the cases, he will get it right, actually. And uh, now, if you have a communication channel that actually sort of works in 50% of the cases and gives you the correct result, you can actually use what is called redundant coding, where you send a message several times, and then you, you, know, you make a guess every time, and then you take the majority vote, and then you actually, with larger and larger probability, you get the, the correct answer. And so this is a method from, quantum, from classical information theory, in fact, that can be used to really show that any protocol can be transformed onto that. And so this is nice because, I mean, Initially, you would say, well, class, I mean, quantum mechanics is not relativistically invariant. Uh, it's not formulated like that. So it's not immediately evident that such arguments should actually work uh, directly. But actually, they do. So here, this is a nice example. And it can, so now, instead of having to go through endless mathematical formulas trying to, or infinitely often trying to find new protocols that might work better, um, you have one argument and it rules out completely um, teleportation protocols that need to send less than two bits of information. Okay, So that's nice. And actually, so as I said, this can be used often, such type of arguments. When you, when you want to remotely, so between different parties, implement some information protocol, um, uh, and you wonder how much information needs to be sent, 
it's a good idea to analyze first how much information can be sent with the task that you want to achieve. Yeah? And that is actually the, typically, one has to of course look a bit, bit more carefully, but typically this is also the minimum amount of information that has to be exchanged to realize this protocol. That was a question, no? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, correct question. I mean, this is uh, not immediately obvious. And when I say explain this in words, that is not a proof. Uh, that's why I suggest, I mean, so the answer is yes, it's exactly the same amount of correlations. Um, it's actually one of those uh, four states that I've written down there. And um, uh, they are locally, unitarily um, related to the original state. So they have the same amount of correlations. But actually, it would be good indeed to write this down because actually, um, I think the real question, uh, the, the, the really critical one is, are there any correlations? Yeah. Um, but I mean, when you do the calculation, you will see that uh, they arrive there. Yeah. Um, right, so now, and that's one question, so that tells you about the classic communication cost. Oh, uh, there's another one. Uh, wait a second, I have to come, because I will probably not hear you very well. Okay? Yeah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Redundant coding, yeah. uh, we can manage it with one bit of information. Yeah. But in the case of. Um, oh, um, so when we say here we have. Okay, so I'll, I'll go down and then. Um, <coughs> So, right, uh, uh, correct question. So, um, so the question was, um, uh, how can I use, let's say, redundant uh, coding and repeating this protocol? So, I mean, because once I've put the state here, taken one state, and after the protocol, it's gone. Yeah, and so I cannot duplicate it. So you always have to remember with these uh, protocols that when I say I, I repeat it, so that means I have a quantum source that can actually repeatedly produce the same state. So there's someone that knows how to prepare the, the state. Yeah? And so in that sense, you can actually repeat this. If someone would only give you ever one particle, then you are completely right. There's nothing that we can do. But you want to have a situation where maybe I share many of these entangled pairs. I have a machine that prepares repeatedly for us several copies of that state, and then we run the protocol. But you don't need to identify what state they are. Yeah? So this is an important, uh, indeed, distinction. Right. Uh, any more questions? OK. So now, the next thing. Next question is, um, how much entanglement do we need for quantum state teleportation? Maybe, I mean, so maybe, I, do I really need a state of this form here, where I have sort of 0, 0 plus 1, 1 with an equal weight in between? Can I, can I do with something less? So for that, um, we first have to um, kind of accept what is almost the, 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 it's almost like the second law of thermodynamics. It's, it's kind of the second law, well, it's actually the first law of, uh, of entanglement theory. Namely, if you have local operations and classical communication, you can create a lot of classical correlations, but you cannot create quantum correlations. So now, what do we mean by that, actually? So, by L O C C and starting with a product state, product state between Alice and uh, Bob. So, for example, um, zero, 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 so that's A, B, A, B. The most 
general state. that we can repair is of the form rho is Okay, and that's called the separable state. Separable and this is classically classically correlated, possibly. Um, so it's called separable. I mean, you know there's also the notion of separable. Hilbert space has nothing to do with that. Um, So, so the, well, there is also, I mean, I just want to point out, there is the concept of separable Hilbert space. And has nothing to do with that, yeah? Has nothing to do with that. So, um, I don't remember actually why it, it precisely it was called like that, but um, I mean, well, I kind of it's separable in the sense that, you know, you can always distinguish. I mean, yeah, well, I don't know. It's a name. Now, uh, it's clear that you can make these states because this is a statistical mixture of product states. Product states I can just make by do something locally and not talk about it at all. Then I have a product state. And if I start from this pure state here and I make my local operations, um, and um, then I will end up in some other product state simply. Now, it could also be that we talk about what we do. So Alice decides that she makes a unitary operation that sigma x, for example, and she tells Bob and says, Bob, why don't you do the same? Yeah. So then she, they may say, Alice may say, OK, initially the state is this. With 50% probability, she does nothing, and she tells Bob, Bob, don't do anything either. Then they end up with this. And then with the other 50% probability, for example, she may say, I will apply a sigma x operation. So her particle will be in state one. And she tells Bob, Bob, do the same. And so Bob will do the same. So now they have two possibilities, either this one or that one. And now they have to do something very active, actually, uh, something that is not so trivial, uh, is namely, they have to forget what they have done. And then you will not have either this or that. You will actually have rho is equal a half, zero, zero, plus one, one projector. Yeah. So actually, more precisely, what they have created here is initially a state that may be written like this. It's one particle that, let's say, Alice might hold. It's her notebook that remembers whether she decided to do nothing or whether she decided to do um, a sigma x operation. And then correlated with that is this state, A, B, A, B. So that represents this information. Because now we can have a look at this notebook and identify which of the states it is. So that's really the same as here. This looks different to that. There's one particle that is gone. And that represents this forgetting because what I mean by forgetting is that we remove our information of whether we applied identity or sigma x or we destroy the notebook. So actually, to get this, so let's call this sigma, then rho is trace of a1, let's call this A1 here. So that's actually how you get then this state here. So that's actually, I mean, and, and this is not a trivial act that you're doing there. Erasing information is not something that just happens by itself. It actually generates heat in the universe. 
And I think uh, probably Mauro, wherever he is, uh, he may actually, yeah, uh, he may actually, I don't know whether you will discuss any of this Landauer principle and so on. Um, yeah, okay, but I mean, so it's basically the fact that you info, erasing information is not for free. It generates heat that's called Landauer's principle, basically, and that's what you will learn about in Mauro's lecture in more, more detail. Anyway, so this is how you create these, these kind of states. And, um, well, these are the only ones. And these are states, because they can be created by local operation and classical communication, they only contain classical correlations. Okay. Um, now, actually, question. Um, is this state psi minus, the projector onto psi minus, is that actually of this form? Well, um, so is um, a, is this proper uh, separable state? And the answer is, uh, well, okay. <laughs> Uh, and that uh, you can do by, for example, direct calculation. So, um, fine. So, these states are the only ones that you can make. This state, uh, by, by, you can only ones that you can make by local operation and classical communication. This state is not of this form. Okay. So now, um, uh, right. Now I have to think for a moment. Um, 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 okay, yeah, right, right. Okay, so now I want to show you that you really do need um, states of this type, so entangled states, to actually make quantum state teleportation. And again, the full proof is a little bit more complicated. Let's show a simple example, right? Um, so, so that's the quantum state teleportation protocol. There is a little barrier here. This is Alice's world. This is Bob's world. Yeah. And um, typically, we come with a state psi, and then we do our business. And in the end, on Bob's side, there's a state psi. Why don't we do the following? On Alice's side, we have A1 and A2. Actually, we prepare two particles. And we prepare them in one of those states up there, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Now we do the teleportation protocol. And again, I mean, it's the same as I used here. Not only the state is transferred, all the correlations that it's carrying is also transferred. So therefore, when I apply the quantum state teleportation protocol, in the end, I have a particle A1 here. And this one, the state of this particle is transferred to Bob's side. So now I have one of these entangled pairs crossing the divide between Alice and Bob. Now imagine this quantum state teleportation protocol would have worked with a state of this form, something that I can make classically uh, by, cl by local, co uh, local operation and classical communication. If that was the case, then actually, by only local operation and classical communication, initially starting this state, I would have created a distributed entangled state, a state that cannot be written of this form. And that's a contradiction. And again now, if you ask yourself, well, OK, if I prepare some state here that is of the form alpha 0, 0 plus beta 1, 1, where alpha and beta are not exactly equal, then you have to make a little bit more work now with the argument. But in the end, a similar argument holds. So this is another principle. The principle that local operations and classical communications can only create separable states. This allows you, in, in all these distributed protocols, it allows you to infer how much entangled resources you need to consume to implement the protocol. Yeah. Um, and so 
Well, the first was superluminal communication. The second actually really does play the role, or very similar role, to the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so that in thermodynamics, well, entropy can only uh, increase. Well, here actually, um, well, in fact, correlations, quantum correlations can only decrease when you act locally. It cannot increase. Yeah? That's the second law. So, and there is a certain, so there are, there are connections now to two other physical theories, relativity and thermodynamics. Yeah? And it turns out, and uh, that, well, yeah, quite possibly <laughs> in the afternoon, um, I will actually make this a little bit more rigorous in the sense that I will show you that thermodynamics can be interpreted as a theory that is really very much like the structure of, thermo uh, of entanglement here. Okay, but that will have to wait until the afternoon. Um, right. Okay, so this is um, that. When you have the piece of a time shape, time is and then you have to do entanglement purification first, which I will explain now. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, then you have to invoke the fact that this is reversible and then you can transfer basically the situation to one that is about a maximally entangled state and, and so on. Yeah. So that's, that's a little bit more work, in fact. So actually what I should also give you is another reference here. So all these things, all this story, and actually also more what, what I will be telling you. Well, I didn't give you lecture notes, uh, but not all, but many of the things that I'm explaining to you are... Um, um, oh, I'm not sure, uh, are written in this article, which is specifically meant to be an article um, for non-expert but clever people, so like you, um, to explain some of the basic aspects of quantum information theory. And so this is um, or the authors as well. So you can find this also on the ePrint archive. I, I don't think that everybody has, will have access to this particular journal. It's a little bit, it's not such one of the big, really big ones. This is a journal for articles for non -ex well, for educated non-experts, basically. And so a lot of these stories, also these arguments about the classical communication requirements and so on, this is all explained at length in this, in this uh, um, article. Um, Perhaps I could make this also simply available somehow to, I don't know whether that's possible. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I download this and, and yeah. Um, it's probably slightly illegal, but uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, we will figure that out. I mean, in the worst case, it's, it's, I think it's on the archive. It's also, um, I've forgotten the archive number, but it's, uh, it's somewhere on the archive, quantph. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure, I think it's, I somehow have a feeling that it's this number, but I'm not completely sure. But you can find it very easily when you search this. Yeah. Okay, so that explains uh, many of these, these uh, basic principles. So, actually, <coughs> um, so let's see. Okay, I mean, in a way, I've, um, yeah, you, okay, so now I, I want, to, want to look further into these correlations because somehow, I mean, I always write down this state here, zero, zero, plus one, one, and this kind of seems to be a rather useful state, yeah? seems to have correlations and can be used in all these protocols. And it's, I'm always using this because, in a sense, it's the most valuable state that we have. Um, so first, I would like to convince you um, that this is the most entangled, the most quantum correlated state that there is when you share two spin one-half particles. 
So one on Alice's side and one on Bob's side. So this is the most entangled state, so the unit of entanglement, so to speak. Yeah. So this state um, is the most entangled state uh, of two shared uh, spin one half particles. So that's a little bit funny. How can I say this when I haven't even told you how to quantify correlations? I have not told you, okay, you know, this is the amount and there's a formula for that and then I computed on this and then I somehow mathematically show that the formula takes the largest value for this state. Uh, zero after the four. Ah, okay, yeah, oh, that makes sense because they're always encoded in three digits, yeah. Okay. So that's the number. Huh? I see, okay. Um, right. So how, why can I say that this is the most entangled state of them all? Well, so I, I, I stated this principle with local operations and cluster communication, you cannot increase uh, correlation, so you can ma cannot make them from nothing. Um, now, um, what would be a valid argument to say that this is the most entangled state? Well, surely, if, for example, any other entangled state can be made from this one by local operations and classical communication. If that's the case, then, well, surely this is the most valuable because everything else can be obtained from it. Um, okay. Again, teleportation will show the way so that we have to do almost no cal calculation, actually. It's, it's very, very simple. So again, um, let's take this situation here. So, so we have here the state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And here's the divide of the world between Alice and Bob. And now, again, I do the same thing as I did already previously in the argument. I prepare on Alice's side two further particles, and uh, those are simply written in any i, j, k, l, rho, i, j, k, l, um, it's just a general density matrix. The most general density matrix of two spin one half particles that you can think of, so any state there is. Now, I apply the quantum state teleportation protocol on these two particles. And I've told you before, any kind of correlations, everything is transferred. And so the outcome of this will be that we share um, two particles in the state row. And on Alice's side here, we will have some quantum state on her side. So we've started with this one, shared between Alice and Bob. We achieved, in the end, the preparation of an arbitrary quantum state between Alice and Bob. So this one is sufficient to generate any other shared quantum state between Alice and Bob. And therefore, this is the most valuable. And it's the most powerful, and therefore, the most quantum correlated at all, because it can also create all possible quantum correlations that there might be. And that's the simplest argument to show that this is really the unit of entanglement, the most entangled state. Okay? So, um, right. Yeah, okay, that's right. So, in fact, you can also show that, and I, I had it noted down, but um, I'm not going through that. You can also show that it's not only possible to use an entangled state to make quantum state teleportation. Actually, if you want to make any quantum gate that is distributed between two parties, or any quantum operation, any quantum algorithm that you want to do, you can always implement it by providing uh, some entanglement between the different nodes, and then do local operations and classical communications, and you will actually be able to implement the quantum algorithm. You may have to provide quite a lot of quantum correlations. It might not be enough to just have one 
pair of particles. You may have to have two or three or many, but it's always possible. Yeah? So, and it's always possible to do this from, from starting from here. And again, one trivial way of seeing that this must be possible, although it's not the most efficient way is, we have two nodes and we want to make a quantum operation between them. We use one pair of this maximally entangled state to teleport one particle from one node to this node. Then we allow it locally to do whatever we want. And then we use another pair of these maximally entangled particles and teleport the particle back. And the end result is that now we have a new transformed state under this local, uh, under this um, quantum operation that we have applied. So it must be possible. This is a valid path, but it's not the most efficient. And actually, so I don't want to tell you uh, the details, but if you look at uh, PR Oh, uh, you see, this is uh, uh, 62. And, uh, and now I have to go back. Um, 0, 5, 2, 3, 1, 7, 2000. That actually, this paper, gives a discussion of how many resources you need to produce, for example, a control not gate or a swap gate and, and various typical quantum operations that you use to write out your quantum algorithms. And actually, the protocols that are given there, some of them at least, are optimal. And the arguments that we are using for that are exactly the ones about the classical information exchange and non-increase of entanglement and so on. And so basically, we give these kind of arguments. And at the same time, we give a protocol that achieves those minimal resources, and therefore, it's optimal. Yeah? And so, yeah, that's described in, in this work, but I don't really want to go into that now um, because I'm seriously running out of time. Okay, um, fine. But I still haven't shown you how we really quantify entanglement. And now, um, this will now uh, start, this will again be quite similar to how we treat correlations and so on in, in classical physics. Um, uh, and in particular, it will mirror also this development that we um, that we quantify information by how well we can compress it, and the same we can do with entanglement. That will give us some measure in some in, in, for a particular case, namely for pure states. And then we have to start to think: what is it that we want to have as properties? of valid entanglement measures in situations where we cannot so easily make such a construction that I will show you. And that will actually be conditions that then we will also use as reasonable uh, requirements for general resource theories, because there will be, be very similar um, or the same constraints. So now, how? to quantify entanglement. So actually, well, OK, that's one way of writing it. I like this one, quantifying entanglement. That was the shortest title of a paper that I ever had. Um, two words, but it encapsulated exactly what we were on about. So this is what we are going to attack now. And this started um, uh, in 96, I think. No, 95, apparently. OK. Um, PRA 532046, 95. Um, that was. Um, I've forgotten exactly who were the authors. I think Bennett, Bernstein, Popescu, and uh, Woodhouse, I think. But I'm not entirely sure. But I mean, this is the reference, so you can find it. Uh, so what I explained to you now, or outlined to you now, is explained in here. Um, but it's also, you can read it in this article. It's also explained there. Um, because these guys were saying, OK, so how do we quantify entanglement? So how much entanglement? 
is in this state when alpha and beta are not equal to 1 over square root of 2. Well, how much is there? Well, it's kind of clear in some limiting cases. When alpha is equal to 1 and beta is equal to 0, there's no entanglement. It has to be 0. But otherwise, who knows? And <clears throat> then these guys were starting to think. And then I thought, well, OK, why don't we do the same as we did for information? We compress, try and compress the entanglement. And so how does this work? So this is uh, entanglement distillation or concentration in this case. And they made an observation that was interesting. So the challenge is, give me uh, a lot of copies, n copies of this kind of state, so 2n particles. We allow local operations, and we allow classical communication. And we want to transform, or try and transform this kind of state into something of, of this form. Yeah? Because this, we kind of accept this is the best state we can possibly have. That's our unit. And so we want to see how effectively can we transform this sort of states into these sort of states. And by that, we mean if we have n copies of that one, then we will end up with n times e copies of that state and other particles that are uncorrelated. And E, this compression ratio, will quantify our entanglement. Okay, that's the idea. So how does one do that? That's actually quite uh, easy. Well, yeah, kind of easy. And um, so again, I will give you, as usual, I will give you the basic idea and then the nasty little calculations that you have to do on top of that, I will just very briefly outline. And then you can either do them yourself um, to have the satisfaction that you're as clever as these people, uh, or you look it up in the end. Yeah? So what can we do? So for that, we make two copies. So that means so we have here Alice, Bob, Alice, Bob. So what do I mean by this now? So let's draw this in in a figure. So what I, by that I mean, we have here A1, A2, B1, B2. We have two identical copies of the state alpha 0, 0 plus beta 1, 1. OK, and now I would like to write out this quantum state to give you an idea of what we're going to do. Um, let's write this out. So this is alpha squared. 0, 0 on Alice's side, 0, 0 on Bob's side, plus alpha beta, in, uh, 0, 1, Alice's side, 0, 1, Bob's side, plus 1, 0, Alice's side, 1, 0, Bob's side, plus beta squared, 1, 1, Alice, 1, 1, Bob. That's the same as this. So if, if both of these particles are in state 0, then these ones are also in state 0. Yeah? OK, so that's the uh, first step. So I just rewrote uh, this somehow. And now um, Alice is going to do a local operation. Actually, she will make a measurement, yeah? which is already a bit surprising, because typically when you do a local measurement, you will destroy correlations between Alice and Bob. So Alice measures um, the observable, let's say x, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 2 times uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, 1, 0, plus 3 times 1, 1. OK, I mean, it's, so, so it's an interesting observable in a way. Eigenvalue 1 belongs to the eigenstate 0, 0. Then eigenstate 3 belongs, uh, eigenvalue 3 belongs to eigenstate 1, 1. And the eigenvalue 2 is degenerate. Okay? So what this actually means is that I count the number 
of uh, particles that are in state one. Uh, uh, a little bit bigger font. Okay, uh, let's do that again. Okay, so basically, I mean, so in words, this counts the number of particles in state uh, one. So, um, and uh, well, mathematically, that's written down like that. So, okay, so let's uh, work out what's happening. So let's remove this. Um, so there's the outcome one. And so that means we have to apply the projector onto state zero. So that means the state after the measurement is this. And that's pretty bad because that is a complete, as a product state, completely uncorrelated. So we kind of didn't do the right thing here, it seems. Um, the same, actually, if I get the outcome three, then I end up with one, one, Alice side, one, one, on Bob side. So also product state. However, if I get this outcome, the outcome two, then I end up with a state 0, 1, Alice, 0, 1, Bob, plus 1, 0, Alice, 1, 0, Bob. And well, OK, divided by square root of 2 for a change, I put the normalization. And that kind of looks already like an entangled state. It's not, I mean, it is an entangled state, but we would like to really massage it a little bit more and bring it really onto a form like that. And for that, Alice and Bob actually locally on their side make a specific unitary uh, transformation. And the unitary that they are doing, so it's UA tensor U, well, U tensor U. And the unitary is such that it has an action on the state 0, 0, action on state 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And um, let's see, what I would like to have here is something like this, something like that. And now I've used up some stuff, so let's say 0, 1, and 1, 0. So these are orthonormal, these are orthonormal, there's a unitary transformation that does that. Yeah? So if I apply this, then actually, um, oh, fuck, this was wrong. D don't write it. Um, uh, Let me just, uh, <coughs> I think this was OK. And this was like that, I think. Um, don't write anything, because I might mess this up again. Yeah, so um, uh, 0, 1, and 1, 1. So for sure, this is a unitary transformation. So let's apply this now to see whether I got this right. Um, so I apply this, so then I find 0, 0, 0, 0, plus, yeah, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay, that's correct, so you can note this down, that's fine. And now I write this again, so, well, now I have to carry, so you see how annoying it is to carry a normalization, so uh, this is a 0, Zero, Alice, one, Bob, one. Zero, um, well, okay, before I say it in words. So now what you see here is this particle here and this particle here. So the second particle that Alice has and the second particle that Bob has is always in state zero. So actually, what we have here is 0, 0 between first particle of Alice and first particle of Bob, plus 1, 1 of the first particle of Alice and Bob, and then 0, 0 of the second particle. So now this is really one pair of particles, spin one half particles, for example, that are in our wonderful unit of entanglement, and the other pair is in a product state. 
Okay, so now you've seen, of course, sometimes this works great. So we actually get something that is now a perfectly entangled state. And we started from something that was kind of with unequal weights, alpha and beta. And sometimes, actually, unfortunately, we lose. We kill our entanglement. Now you have to sort of start to say, well, OK, what's the probability for these different outcomes? And then you can say, well, what's the average amount of perfect entanglement that I obtain? And here it is, actually, the probability to get this is 2 times alpha squared times beta squared um, is the probability to get this. And so therefore, you can say the original two particles contained at least this amount of entanglement because it's the probability of getting a perfectly entangled state. And let's say we give this the unit one. Yeah. Is this optimal? Well, surely not, because I acted only on two parties. So now, um, basically, what we are doing here is very similar to quantum data compression. Now, if we have alpha 0, 0 plus beta 1, 1, n copies. We can write this out, and then this will be alpha to the power of n, where we have a state where all the particles are in state 0, multiplied with all particles in state 0. So this is on Alice's side, it's Bob's side again. Yeah. And then we have um, alpha to the power of n minus 1 times beta. And then we have 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, plus, well, the next possibility, and so on. So all the possibilities of placing a single particle in state 1, uh, uh, distributing this amongst the particles. So there are n choose 1 of those states. Well, so then in general, we will have alpha n to the minus k, beta to the power of k. And then, well, we have doo -doo 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 -doo, k of those, um, and then n minus k of those, plus all the permutations of which there are n choose k. Uh, but the nice observation here is they all have the same weight. Yeah. And now you can imagine, ha, huh, probably I can make a trick like here, making a local unitary transformation, reordering things, so that I get a certain number of pairs that are exactly in this maximally entangled state, and a lot of others that are actually simply in a product state 0, 0. Yeah. So that's the idea, and you know, try and write this out. Um, that's a little bit painful, actually, but it can be done. And then the question is, well, OK, um, how many of these maximally entangled pairs of maximally entangled states will I get? Well, <clears throat> that's actually quite easy. How many, um, how many terms are in this here? So it's n choose k. Yeah. If, I have, if I now make this unitary transformation, that does not change the number of superposition terms. If I would be able to transform this in simply one of those, and the rest are product states, that would be two uh, superposition terms. If I have two copies, then it's four. If I have three copies, it's eight. So the number of maximally entangled pairs that I get is the logarithm of n choose k. Right. So. Now, how much is it on average? Because I really have to kind of average this. Well, which of these outcomes has the highest probability? Well, actually, now you, you impose the law of large numbers, and you realize that um, the typical term that you are getting is one where k is n times beta squared. Yeah? Because that's kind of the probability that you find a 1. And then, uh, well, you have your binomial law and so on. And then you can go through the details. And you see that this is the best. So, And by the law of large numbers, the larger n will become, the more certain you will be that you pretty much get this. And so therefore, this is logarithm of n over a uh, choose n beta squared. And that 
um, is n times, well, the Shannon entropy of alpha squared and beta squared. Or, equivalently, it's n times the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix of one of these states. Okay, so that was quick. Um, it's detailed over there in that paper, but that's the, that's the principal idea. And now, this is in full analogy to, to you know, this uh, dense coding, uh, not dense coding, the quantum data compression. This is the compression ratio. Therefore, we say that each of these particles contains an amount of quantum correlations or entanglement that is S times, so the, the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix of one of the particles. Yeah. That's um, one half, so that's, that's, it's, that's already a good suggestion uh, that this is the right formula, but actually, I'm not quite finished. Because what we really would like is that also the reverse process gives the same efficiency. Because if it does not, then, you know, we would have two perfectly valuable and valid quantifiers of entanglement. So what is the reverse process? The reverse process is we start with some perfectly entangled states, uh, namely this many, and by some local operation classic communication, we want to create n partially entangled states of this form. So we really want to reverse this process. Is this possible? Well, yes it is, and uh, the knight is riding to, that is uh, riding to our defenses, the quantum state teleportation, mixed um, with a bit of uh, quantum data compression. So, what do we do? So, we have our So these are n times um, n times s of rho a, where uh, rho a is the reduced density matrix of one of those. And um, yeah, that's what we have. <coughs> and uh, of course here, as usual, Alice and Bob. And now, um, let's try and turn this into that. And to this end, we start out actually with uh, state alpha 0, 0 plus beta 1, 1. So we have lots of them. Yeah. Um, right. So obviously we have too many. We cannot just take this one, use uh, that maximally entangled state and make teleportation because then we can only transfer n, uh, n, n times uh, s of those here and the rest will stay where they are. So we have not achieved our task. So we have to be a little bit more efficient on this side. Okay, so why don't we do a very simple trick that we just used. We take these. And if it's a very large number of them, we actually um, make kind of the, the first step of this procedure, namely on Alice's side. We look at the particles, we, we make a measurement, we look how many ones and zeros there are, and in that way, we can compress the information on, on this half of the particles into a smaller number. So in the end, it will actually look like this. Um, so all these particles here, there will be somehow, um, so all the particles here will now be entangled with just the first few, yeah? and I know that I can bring this down to n times s of rho a because of this procedure, and these ones here will be disentangled. So there will be a lot of particles down here that are just in the product state. And now I take these few, I teleport them with these maximally entangled states. So I bring this to the other side, and I don't really want to draw this now because it will be a mess. But once I'm on this side here, 
I undo exactly this process. I just undo this uh, unitary transformation. Now, that actually is the reverse process. Now that it's really asymptotically has the same efficiency, you really have to go through calculation now. This is because in every step, from here, from here to here for every finite n, you lose a little bit. And you have to show that this little bit per particle goes to zero. And that's, you use the law of large numbers and, all, and an explicit construction to show this. But the outcome of all of this is indeed that, well, you have the process of concentration that has this efficiency. You have the process of dilution, which has the same efficiency. So you can go forward and backward as often as you like. So it's a reversible process. And because they have the same efficiency, really, this justifies why we really like to call the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix of a quantum of a two-particle system as the entanglement content. Now, this is only true when the state is pure. Yeah? When the state quantum state is mixed, the von Neumann entropy is not a good quantifier of entanglement because, in fact, neither this procedure nor that procedure will have this efficiency. Actually, the efficiency is lower. Okay, so that's, that's why we like to say the von Neumann entropy is a good entanglement measure for pure states. Um, I've forgotten what I want to say now. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you can ask yourself maybe, uh, so now I try and make uh, use of uh, kind of thermodynamic arguments again. You know, maybe one of these procedures can be even more efficient. Maybe I was just stupid. Maybe I could have provided some much cleverer scheme here, more elaborate stuff on Alice and Bob's sides, more complicated operations, and I could have had a little bit higher efficiency. Why not? Um, and that's actually not so straightforward to show because you again have to study all possible protocols of which there are very many. Um, and you have to show that none of them is uh, performing better. So that's not very efficient. So let's invoke uh, the, 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 the law of uh, entanglement theory, namely that you cannot increase entanglement by local operations of classical communication. So we have here on the left hand side, you can view this as a process um, um, okay well let's draw it like this <coughs> let's assume that this dilution process really has this efficiency s of rho a and uh, let's assume that the concentration process is a little bit better. So we can go actually from n to n times s of rho a plus epsilon of maximally entangled pairs. Let's assume that. So now I can make the following. I start out with this, and I use it to produce this many maximally entangled pairs. So then I say, OK, I have S of rho A plus N times epsilon. These ones I use with a reverse protocol to go back to the original situation, to my original N particles. And this one I put in a safe deposit box in the bank or in an experimental physics laboratory. And then I repeat this process. And every time I repeat this, I have left over n times epsilon maximally entangled pairs in addition. That means if I can make, run this cyclically as many times as I like, and I will create more and more entanglement, but all the operations that I've used are local operations and classical communications. So, but these cannot create quantum entanglement. So therefore, this cannot be more efficient. This is a contradiction to our fundamental law. And in fact, you can really look at this in terms of engines, where you say, well, I have a machine that does some useful work. It, it takes these partially uh, entangled states, man massages them, works on them, 
brings out this concentrated form, like a distillery for or alcohol or something like that. What comes out on the side is actually classical information, because we are making a measurement here. It's a classical information record that is produced in addition on the side. So it looks a little bit like this. So here we start with um, n particles. Here we have n of s rho a particles. And here what comes out is information. Uh, so information. Yeah. And the other process over there, so this flows from in this direction, looks actually pretty much the same, but it flows in the opposite direction. So it's S of N of S or OA. Then we start with maximal entangled pairs. We push them up here. We have N partially entangled pairs. And again, also in the teleportation, we actually have to do some measurements and so on. And there will be a measurement record. And that's also, again, information that comes out. And if you want to operate this cyclically, actually, then we have information coming out here, information coming out here. To make it truly cyclical, we have to erase this information that actually generates a little bit of heat. So this is, again, this is kind of a slightly more thermodynamical picture of these processes. And because one goes down in this way, one goes up in this way, we can combine them. The net effect must be a decrease in entanglement and an increase in heat in the environment. Okay? But they cannot increase the amount of entanglement here. Right. Um, uh, seven minutes, right? That's correct. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now, uh, perfect. Okay. Fine. That was for pure states, and here we understand everything in a way. What is the situation for mixed states? And uh, so now for mixed states, so this is called, this process is entanglement distillation, and it has a certain efficiency, which will quantify our entanglement. And this efficiency we call the distillable entanglement. This is a process of dilution, which is also has an, having efficiency, and uh, that's called the entanglement cost. So how much maximally entangled pairs do we need to create an arbitrary distributed entangled state? And now, what one finds is the distillable entanglement, ED of rho, is typically, well, strictly smaller than the entanglement cost. That means if we do this process, and then afterwards we use what we get, the concentrated entanglement, and try and dilute it again, we will not get back the original amount of entanglement that we put in, but we get actually less. And not only a little bit less that vanishes in the limit of, I mean, uh, in, that might vanish in the limit of large n, it is actually for each copy that we put in, we lose a finite amount of entanglement. Yeah? So it's, it's really, we start with n, and afterwards, let's say, we end up with half n of particles and not with n minus square root of n or so, which would be kind of tolerable. So it's really a finite big difference. Yeah? So now in mixed state entanglement, we really have a problem. This is a perfectly operationally defined nice entanglement quantifier. This, the entanglement cost, is also a perfectly well-defined entanglement quantifier. So we have two. And actually, I will, well, will, will show you uh, in, the, in the afternoon, there are many. And they're all different. In fact, you can say something like the following, roughly speaking, although it uh, has to have some additional qualifiers. If you find another entanglement measure, so let's say, um, let's call it for reasons that will become clear in the afternoon, E sub R of rho. That's another entanglement quantifier. Let's say it's really different to these two. But let's assume that on pure states, all the three of them agree. Yeah? And there is at least one such example. Um, and now you can say, and now I tell you, well, actually, on pure states they agree, but in general they are different. And so you may say, yeah, well, who cares? 
perhaps they impose the same order on the set of entangled states. So by that I mean maybe they have something like if, um, so if, so if ER row one is bigger than E R row two, so two possible entangled states, and we compare them and see under this measure this one is bigger than that one. Maybe that's equivalent to distillable entanglement also being bigger than row two, or maybe the same statement here. <clears throat> if that was the case, then we would really not worry very much about these entanglement measures not being the same. Yeah? Because, I mean, they make the same order. We can clearly say this state is more entangled than this one under all measures. Question, is this true? Well, the answer is no. Um, if this was true, <coughs> then this measure is identical to this one. If, however, they are different, <coughs> then there's always a pair of states for which one entanglement measure says row one is more entangled than row two, and another measure of entanglement says exactly the opposite. And so now this is a little bit of a worrying situation if you think about, I mean, you would feel initially. So now it really very much depends on which measure you take um, when you want to decide which state is more valuable than another. So this is um, <coughs> um, the proof of this is very easy. Uh, I think it's here. I think in 2000. So that's myself and and uh, Shashank Birmani, my student at that time. <coughs> um, now, but maybe this is actually not so surprising because this procedure and that procedure are really quite different. They are operationally describing a completely different setting. One is concentration, one is dilution. Maybe these other measures also, they co maybe they correspond to some completely different operational procedure. Why? would we actually expect that each entangled state is equally useful for any possible procedure? That's not at all obvious. Yeah. And that's exactly what this expresses. It, the value of entanglement now depends very much on what you want to do with it, at least for mixed states. Yeah. <coughs> for some tasks, it's better to have this sort of entanglement. For other tasks, it's better to have that sort. And by that sort, I mean represented in this quantum state or that quantum state. Yeah. But that now poses a, a, a problem, nevertheless, because now you can say, well, there are whatever, two measures, maybe there's a third one, actually there are many more. Which mathematical quantities are decent measures of entanglement and which ones are not? And to decide that, next in the afternoon, I will write down some conditions that are sensible and then I would say anything that satisfies those conditions is a valuable entanglement measure. And when I've done that, then I'm kind of not really finished with entanglement theory, but I've said enough about entanglement theory. And then I want to use exactly those conditions and the principles that you have learned in the last few lectures here to actually speak more generally about resources and how we quantify those. Yeah. Because it will follow almost exactly what I've shown you here, except that I stop talking about entanglement. I just say a resource. And I will stop about talking about local operations and classical communication. I will say the operations that are available to you. And I will not stop speaking about separate laboratories and distances and the inability to transfer particles. I will just say a certain set of operations that is not allowed for us. And this can be formulated abstractly like that. And then we can write down these conditions. And then I can show you, as the final thing, that under this framework, <coughs> a lot of things fit. So for example, quantum coherence is actually a resource for a certain task. And it can, quanti can be quantified following these approaches. Non-classicality 
can actually be considered a resource and can be quantified in these manners. Thermodynamics can actually be formulated as a resource theory. Generally, any setting in the world where you have a constraint, where certain things are not possible for you, can be, formula, can be translated into a resource theory setting. And the nice thing about this is that, of course, these resource theories share some similar, uh, the same mathematical structure. So if your proofs are sufficiently general, and they really only make use of the fundamental aspects of resource theory, they apply in all the theories. And that's kind of neat. Uh, so it's, a, it's an overarching structure that allows you to make statements about all physical theories that arise from constraints and resources. And that's kind of nice because it really encompasses pretty much everything that we use. And it's a different way of looking at quantum physics uh, because before we were looking at correlations and so on as strange phenomena. But now we really talk about all physical properties um, as are they useful for something? How valuable are they? And how can we quantify this? How can we transform these resources? And what can be achieved there? And actually, as I said, this encompasses many physical theories. OK, so with that, I close. And um, so the announced, um, tentatively announced lecture will have to take place, because obviously I have not managed to do this yet. Thanks. Thank <laughs>